we encounter in today's gospel a big contrast and a big surprise. The contrast is between those who are working for God and those who are not. As the Lord says, some are for him, some are against him. The surprise is that those who might seem to be working for the Lord, in fact, may not be. And those who seem to be working for him, in fact, may be. And so far as all of us are here because we want to be working for the Lord, because we want to hear him say one day to us, well done, my good and faithful servant. We need to examine what Jesus says today and apply it to our own actions to see whether we really are working for him or against him. We start with God's collaborators. God wants all of us on his team working for him and his kingdom. In the first reading, Moses says, would that all the Lord's people were prophets. The Lord wants all of us to preach him, to spread his truth, to invite others into the circle of his incredible love. He said this to us in many ways. His last words before ascending to the Father were, go out to the whole world and proclaim the good news. He called us to be the light of the world, reflecting the light of his truth and the great warmth of his love to others. He said that those who are great in his kingdom will keep my words and teach others to do the same. Proclaiming this gospel, as Jesus told us, is not just saying, Lord, Lord, but doing God's will for each one of us. And he wants, us, he wants to help us to seek, find, treasure, and do his will, and to make disciples of all nations. But what we see in today's readings is that sometimes those on the Lord's team aren't wearing the team uniforms, and those who are often are not actually helping the team win. In our first reading, Eldad and Medad were not among the original 70 elders chosen to prophesy in the Lord's name. And so Joshua, still young and immature, who would become Moses' successor, objected, Moses, stop them. Imagine, Joshua wanted them to stop preaching about the Lord. Well, who was working for the Lord here, and who was not? Now Moses told Joshua that there was no reason to be jealous. God wants all to be prophets, and always work outside of our cozy parameters. Even those we think are not the ones chosen by the Lord to be his ambassadors, that may be the other Christians that we may hold in some lower standard than we think of as ourselves, well, they are. In fact, his emissaries and co-works, if the Spirit is working through them. And we see the same lesson again in the Gospel. The disciples caught someone who wasn't among their number, casting out demons in Jesus' name. And so John and the other disciples tried to stop him. Well, who was working for the Lord? And who was working against him here? The disciples were the ones who were supposed to be God's collaborators. But like Joshua, they haven't figured out God's ways. He had come to set prisoners free, defeat Satan once and for all, but his still immature disciples wanted to stop someone else from casting out devils, from doing the Lord's work. Because essentially, they were more concerned with what they wanted to be, the exclusive disciples in God's kingdom. Now, none of us should ever think that we have a monopoly on the name, the mission, message, and power of Jesus Christ. And we should never find God's action in others a threat, but rather something to marvel at and praise him for. Now, we should, of course, want to help them come to the fullness of the truth about God as revealed to us by Christ and his church, but we should rejoice that others, at whatever stage of revelation they have received, would be corresponding to a gentle breeze of the Holy Spirit. And so then we can repeat with Moses, would that all God's people be prophets? But not all God's people are, in fact, prophets. And Jesus quite strongly says that there are those who are against him. 
those who not only do not work for him, but actively oppose him. Now we see many of these opponents in the Gospels, Satan in the desert, some of the scribes and Pharisees during Jesus' public ministry, Herod the Great at Jesus' birth, Pontius Pilate and Herod Antipas at Jesus' death, and even for a short time, St. Peter, whom Christ called Satan and told to get behind him when he rejected the possibility that the Lord would suffer. Those, however, were not the ones Jesus specified in the episode that we hear today. He's referring rather to those who give scandal. Those who are arguing against him are the false prophets who teach others, especially the young, not about how to know, love, and serve God, but rather how to sin. And he passionately warns everyone who harms little ones through scandal to know what punishment they should expect. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and thrown into the sea. Those are pretty harsh words. The word scandal in the original language of the Bible meant two things, something that causes another to fall and something that is an obstacle to someone's doing good. And applied to the matters of faith, scandal is something that either causes another to sin against God or something that prevents the access of another, an obstacle, to the kingdom of God. Many of those in the church today who seem to be on the Lord's team often turn out to be false prophets, erroneous teachers of others, rather than those who pass on to them the truth. Jesus wants us to be brutal in cutting out of our lives not only what leads us to sin, but what causes others to sin. And today he wishes to give us the help and the motivation to do so. Now, we could easily find examples of those whose deeds lead others astray, bishops and priests who haven't walked the walk, as we've seen in the scandals of sexual abuse, or those that are watered down the truths of our faith, or black and white of sin, of good and evil, somehow get put into a little gray spot, and you're encouraged to use your conscience to be your guide but not providing you the guidance to form that conscience. We have celebrities from the world of music, movies, sports, whose example draws the young into drugs, into using others in relationships, into the worship of status. Educators who teach young people in public schools about topics I won't discuss because you all know what they are, topics well beyond the age, the tender age, the vulnerable age that they are. Topics that are totally contrary to the natural and moral law. And we have politicians who pretend that their duty to the Constitution trumps their duties to God. If it were possible to buy stock in Millstone business today, now would be the time to buy. And what about each one of us? Does our example inspire or discourage young people to pray? to come to Mass, to go to confession, to learn the faith, fight against sin, sacrifice ourselves to care for the poor and the needy, to use appropriate language, be honest, stay faithful to the Lord in terms of love, sex, marriage, and family, and to forgive and give people a second chance. By the entire orientation of our life, the way we act at home, the way we act out in public, certainly the way we worship here in our parish church, are, they, are we motivating or are we dissuading the young to become true saints, to love God with all their mind, their heart, their soul, and their strength? The young learn from those who are older what's really important in life. And so we need to focus on what we're teaching, not just by our words, but by our example.